death will be no more. Mourning and crying and pain will be no more. The first thing is passed away. And the one who was seated on the throne said, See, I am making all things new. Also, he said, Write this, for these words are trustworthy and true. Then he said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty, I will give water as a gift from the spring of the water of life. The word of the Lord. I invite you to stand with me for the reading of the Holy Gospel. The Holy Gospel is a reading from St. John, the 11th chapter. Glory unto you, O Lord. When Mary came where Jesus was and saw him, she knelt at his feet and said to Jesus, Lord, if you would have been here, my brother would not have died. And when Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who came with her also weeping, greatly disturbed in spirit and deeply moved. And he said, Where have you laid him? And they said to him, Lord, come and see. And Jesus began to weep. So the Jews said, See how he loved him. But some of them said, Could not he who opened the eyes of the blind men have kept this man from dying? Then Jesus, again greatly disturbed, came to the tomb. It was a cave, and the stone was lying against it. And Jesus said, Take away the stone. Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, already there is a stench, because he has been dead four days. And Jesus said to her, Did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone, and Jesus looked upward and said, Father, I thank you for having heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I have said this for the sake of the crowd standing here, so that they may believe that you sent me. And when he had said this, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. And the dead man came out, his hands and his feet bound with strips of cloth, and his face was wrapped in a cloth. And then Jesus said to them, Unbind him and let him go. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. You may be seated. O well, grace to you in peace from God our Father and from our precious Lord and Savior Jesus Christ on this All Saints Sunday. Uh, the tradition here at Grace Lutheran on All Saints Day is uh, to remember uh, those that have passed uh, this uh, last year uh, from last year's All Saints Day. And not only to remember those saints, our loved ones that have died, that have lived and been among us, a part of this community and, and, and part of our faith community, but it is also to remember those that we baptized uh, this past year. Uh, so um, we will be lighting candles in, in memory of the baptized uh, the saints and, and also those who live in uh, God's great eternity, the saints that have died. We're going to welcome families uh, to come forward um, as we sing our hymn together uh, after the sermon. Uh, just so you're prepared for that, we'll invite the families of the newly baptized to come forward first while we're singing. And I should probably remind you of that again. I, I know that uh, not every word that the preacher says is uh, adhered to or listened to uh, immediately, so I'll, I'll give you a reminder. Um, uh, but it's a, a great day, and I think our tradition here in church is, is very, very meaningful. Some of you, when you came in, and I hope you noticed that this, that you had uh, also an opportunity to remember the loved one that you have uh, lost, and uh, by writing your names on a piece of ribbon, and that would be part of our worship a time this morning as well. So if you did not have an opportunity to do that when you came in, I'm, I'm sure that there's more ribbon and uh, you certainly would be welcome. I'll, I'll even let you leave during my sermon. I'll excuse you during my sermon today. You'll, you'll probably all leave then, <laughs> give you that opportunity. But we, uh, we want you to participate in ways that are meaningful for you on this whole same stage as well. 
Because we realize that when someone you love dies, when you've lost someone uh, that you love, you uh, also uh, feels like you're burying your heart along with them. When you bury your loved one, you also bury a part of your heart as well. And it can take years to make your way through that uh, time of grief, uh, through that dark valley of bereavement. And I think ironically, when you bury your heart, it's difficult to get back into living your life. It's hard to do that when you bury your heart. And it really does not matter how long that you've known that person who has died. It doesn't matter if that person was old or young. What matters is how much you love that person. That's what matters. And at the funeral, what matters even more is how much you believe in the resurrection to be true of life. And this is why our congregation celebrates all saints on the first Sunday in November. In the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, we find our own hope for life beyond the grave so that we can get back to the work of living. And that hope makes all the difference in how we handle our grief. And how we handle our grief is informed to us by the Holy Scriptures. For it is in the Holy Scriptures that we get a glimpse of heaven. In that text that Carrie read this morning, we get a glimpse of what the resurrection to eternal life means, not just for our loved ones who have died, but we get a glimpse of what it means for us, for those who are trying to unbury our hearts and to get back to living life. The glimpse of heaven we receive from the book of Revelation is not in geographical terms, but it is in relational terms. The book of Revelation tells us that we have this God that has come to live among us. So heaven for us is not just a place, a location. But heaven for us is a relationship with this God who comes to live with us. It is still presented as a place, but it is a place in the very heart of God. This heart of God that it is our true home. And then the text from Revelation tells us that heaven is like a great wedding feast where Christ is the bridegroom and Christ binds us as the bridegroom to himself. I think that this is so important. I know that some of you have recently hosted a wedding. In Scripture, in the Old Testament and the New Testament, we are given this imagery of a wedding so many times. And the glimpse of heaven that we get is a wedding feast that has no ending. Now I think when you host a wedding or when you plan a wedding, there is a sense that, well, wouldn't this be great if this should go on and on? But if you're paying for the wedding, you probably don't want that to be the case. But you see, Scripture gives us this idea that God is the host to this wedding banquet that has absolutely no ending. God is the only host that can do that for us. Christ, the bridegroom, is binding himself to us. And so this wedding feast is a repeated metaphor in Scripture. And maybe that's so because in the ancient world, in life of the ancient world and in ancient society and in a small town or a small village, the best things that happened were weddings. Because in the ancient world, life was very difficult. And so weddings would be an event that the whole community would gather and celebrate. And everyone would exult over this man and this woman over the love 
that they're sharing with one another, with uh, they're exchanging vows, and they're being lost really in the wonderment of this love that they share. And actually, in a small town, everybody is lost in that love. That's why weddings are such great occasions for us. So in using this metaphor, the text is telling us that heaven proclaims that you are lost in the love of God, that you exalt in God's love, that you are the very beloved of God, as are those you care about who have died. And they are not still dead, but they are alive. They are alive, and they also are exalting in this love, in this marriage feast. And if heaven claims that you already are the beloved of God, it means that you have a God who has taken a wedding vow with you. It means that you are not alone. You have the love of God, and you still have the love of those who loved you, who died, but yet still live. The great doctrine of the communion of saints proclaims that love is one thing that is never lost. It is the only thing that not even death can take away from us. So if you have lost someone who has died, you don't have to wonder where he or she is. You have only come to this table, you have only come to this altar, Christ's table, to find out where they're at. Because here you find communion with Christ, but you also find communion with all those that you have lost who have died. You commune with Christ, yes, but you also commune with all of your loved ones. That means that at this table, we still get a taste of their love for us. We never lose that love that they have shared with us in this life. That's why we're going to bring those ribbons of your loved ones forward when we share in communion. Because those people and the people that we remember today, they are exalting in this love that we all share. Now Jesus loved these I am statements, and you know some of them. Jesus loves to say things like, I am the bread of life. Jesus loved to say, I am the good shepherd. I am the gate. I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. But immediately before he raised Lazarus, he made another I am statement. And he actually said, I am the resurrection. I am the resurrection. And I am the life. And so after Jesus said this, he asked Martha a question that he still asks people today. A question that he still asks you and he still asks me when he says, I am the resurrection of life. He turns to Martha and he says, do you believe this? And Jesus turns to you today and asks you that same question. Do you believe this? Do you believe that I am the resurrection and the life? And then Jesus finds Martha's sister Mary and the other mourners. And the text says that Jesus saw Mary weeping, and the Jews had come along to grieve with her. They also were weeping. And the text tells us that, that Jesus was deeply moved in spirit, and that he was troubled. Now the word weeping, I think, can be a little bit misleading for us. It sounds like what people in our culture do a lot, just kind of quiet weeping. Just kind of a, a low sniffling, right? But this isn't what this text means. Do you know that in Jerusalem, even today, there is a wall where people go to lament and to cry out to God? And do you know what the name of this wall is? It is called the Wailing Wall. The Wailing Wall. A lot of cries of anguish are heard at this wall. And so that's what's really going on here in this text. Jesus sees this wailing. He sees the wailing of Mary. He sees the wailing of Martha. He sees the wailing of all the Jews that had loved Lazarus, Lazarus because Lazarus had now died. Jesus sees this, and Jesus sees Lazarus and he begins to weep along with the people that had gathered. He 
begins to wail along with the people that were wailing. Jesus wailed. Jesus burst into tears. Why does Jesus do this? Don't you think Jesus knew what he was about to do? That he was going to raise Lazarus from the dead? Why do you think Jesus was wailing with these people? Why does grief come pouring out of him like this? And I think this is a very important part of the story. I think why John draws attention to this is because it's important to know that this is the revelation of God's heart. This is a revelation of the greatness of God's heart. This is God's heart for God's people who are headed for the graves. Jesus weeps, and he weeps for the world, and he weeps for you, and he weeps for me, and he weeps for all of us. Because Jesus knows that we are broken. Jesus knows that we are in need of healing. Maybe we're in need of healing from our grief. Jesus knows this and he weeps for this. And you know that no other major religion makes a statement like this. That a God would come to us and weep with us. No other major religion makes this type of statement except for this God, this God of Christ, this God of Christianity. Jesus weeps. Jesus stops and he stands at the face of this tomb, a tomb that, that is just like the tombs in which millions of bodies have been laid before this moment and will be laid afterwards. And Jesus says, remove the stone. And then he says, Lazarus, he calls out Lazarus' name. And he says, come out. Come out. And to be honest, I think this is what it means to be a saint. This is exactly what it means to be a saint. It means to hear the voice of Jesus calling your name. Saying your name. It's recognizing that God has called us by name, chosen us before the foundation of the world, and promised to do great things for us and through us for the sake of all of the saints that God loves. We might seem like unlikely characters for God to choose and use, but anyone who is even a little bit familiar with the biblical story can tell you that's pretty typical of this God. This is what this God does. And so maybe on this All Saints Day, as we gather to remember our loved ones, maybe on this All Saints Day we should just remember God's heart for us. Maybe we ought to remember that God has a heart for you and that God's love is always for us always and forever for you. And this is why we can face the loss of our loved ones we remember on this day, because we know that God has loved and still loves each and every one of them, and has brought them over from this life through the gateway of death to a new and abundant life with God, where the saints are all triumphant. And so this is why we can go out into this week we can go out into this world and face the challenges that are before us because we know that God accompanies us into this week and world and promises to use us, to use you to accomplish God's will. And by our very presence, God will use you to sanctify the world, to make holy the world, the world in which God loves. So can you do that, O oh, saints of God? Can you remember today God's heart that is always a heart for you? I guess that's a question that you can answer. Or might I say, do you believe in Jesus, who is the resurrection and the life? 
Amen. Well, let's celebrate then this Jesus who is the resurrection and the life, recalling now those that have been baptized and those that have died in the name of this Jesus. And so we'll turn to our bulletins for our liturgy. In holy baptism, God makes saints out of sinners. In holy communion, God forgives the sins of all the saints. So in the assembly today, we give thanks for all the saints, the newly baptized, and those whom from their labors rest, who have fought the good fight and who have gained the crown. Recalling that we have been sealed by the Holy Spirit and sustained by the Savior's body and blood, we keep on keeping on as God gives us breath to the praise of God's glory. I'm going to invite now the families that are here to remember their loved ones who have been baptized this past year. So we'll have you gathered up front here just as we sing our hymn morning. I can't see some of 
हमारे यहाँ तो उत्तर लगे
Uh, we should have representatives of the church maybe standing ready to light a candle um, in memory of the local ones that we call them. So we begin remembering together the saints of God, Dan Nomi. And if you'll like to use the large gold candles that are there. Thank you. 